question. Probably if you're standing here in the corner and out of the way by the microphone. So a number of years ago, Russ Lang asked me, who was at the time acting director and <coughs> husband of uh, Alain, who is the curator here, and he says, why don't you put together a little talk about how the Fresnel lens works? And I said, yeah, I can do that. So I looked through about three pages of encyclopedias and internet, and it broke down into uh, formulas on optics. And that wouldn't take very much learning to put everybody to sleep. <laughs> so I figured it'd be easier to look at the history of how lighthouses were, were lit and what happened. The Brunel lens was a key part of all of this. And they're still in use. But it was uh, just leading up to this and what, what all happened. The whole thing is a, a very interesting story. So we're going to go from the candles, which were used for a long, long time, up to the Fresnel lens, and I, and we do have some new inventions using LEDs, so we'll go through that. But the earliest navigation aid that's been recognized is the Colossus of Rhodes. And you always see this picture of the Colossus standing over the entrance to the harbor. Well, the fire was at the top of it, 100 foot tall, on a, and it's all made out of bronze or an iron, iron frame. And the historians have documented that the, the remains of it that was knocked down with an earthquake have been on, on the ground in Greece for over 800 years. People would come and get the pieces of bronze and use it for various other things. But when you think about it, that it took 12 years to build, so chances are it was standing on top of a pedestal somewhere near the harbor. It wouldn't be like this standing up there and have the harbor closed for 12 years. I don't think any harbor master would say that does not make a lot of sense. <clears throat> and the fire was still at the top, and workers had to carry the coal up to the top or wood and light the fires up there. But the earliest navigation aid that was really in any use was in Alexandria, where they had two chimneys, one for the smoke from the fire and the other where they used polished metal plates to reflect the light up to the top of the uh, of the lighthouse where the, the light would emanate. And that's where ferology came from, the science of lighthouses. So you guys all learn a new word tonight. Okay, requirements for the lighthouse. Tall with a visible light. That's most important. Bright, because a dim light would just doesn't go very far, and we'll learn that in a little bit. A big diameter beam, because when you're 10 miles away, a big beam is still only a little tiny light. A tinier light doesn't get at any distance. You can try that at home, put a little flash right out and walk away from it and see how far you go before you, you can't see it. You want a flash that's going to attract attention, and it has to withstand the weather. Almost every story you read about any particular lighthouse, at any one time in its history, it's been destroyed by the weather. Almost every lighthouse, in, at least that I've read about in the United States. And it has to be able to support the keepers either in the building like we do at the Roundup Light, or in many other lighthouses where the, uh, there's ancillary buildings that the keepers lived in. A little bit of physics. There's a critical path from the height of the lighthouse across the curvature of the earth to the top of the crow's nest where somebody's looking for the light. So if each one of these are 100 foot high, you can see for 24 nautical miles. In the early lighthouse days, the light would probably fall off somewhere in here. So you wouldn't even see the lighthouse with the, without a Fresnel lens. If you doubled the height of these, you'd add about another eight miles to the uh, total distance that you could see, again, because of the curvature of the Earth. A little bit more physics. Light falls off at the square of the distance away from the light source. This is illuminating light, so if you have a, a candle in here shining at a piece of cardboard out here, you'd have one foot candle. Then you go out a little bit further, you go two feet, you get a quarter of the amount of light hitting something. Now that this is true in clear, dry air. Put a little humidity in the air, put a little fog in the air, and you have another problem. Your light doesn't go anywhere near as far. So that's another problem they had to overcome. This is Pigeon Point Light in California with uh, 
I think a 20 bullseye Fresnel lens in steady state, not turning. But when this thing rotates, you're constantly getting that flash. I think it rotates about once every uh, two minutes. So you're getting a flash coming by you all the time. And easy to recognize that where that's the lighthouse. Anything that would burn was used as a fuel from the beginning of time. Wood, coal. The English started using candles, and we'll talk about that. Whale oil came in as they developed the uh, uh, oil burning lamp. Kerosene got into the Norwegians and Swedes, the Nordic countries, used a lot of acetylene and vaporized fuels. And then finally, electricity came on to the point where they built generators at lighthouses that were remote, fired by diesel fuel. Come to find out it was more difficult to use the generators and, and diesel fuel to make electricity than it was to have a burner burning uh, whale oil or something like that. So they were, that approach was abandoned until they could run cables out to the lighthouse. So the earlier fires, they had a brazier that basically a iron pot with coal or in it or wood, and you just build a fire in it and let it stand on the point that you were trying to protect. The uh, Scandinavians built this <coughs> viper fire where you basically had a basket of fire, kind of like this, and they just raised it on a pole and kept that up overnight, had tenders on, on critical points where the ships had to come through, primarily to light the entrance to harbors. And <coughs> fire would go down, the guys would lower it down, throw more wood in it. The Eddystone light was probably the, the major light in uh, the channel between England and France. And it was on a reef off of Plymouth. They had a candle opera that held 24 candles and the candles would burn for three hours. So chances are they would, they probably had two or three of these. They'd get the candles all racked up, race it to the top of the lighthouse, light the candles, burn for three hours while that was being, was burning, they were busy putting candles in the next one and continue to do that. And from a book I read that says, you could see the light from a telescope from Coswell, which is about 14 miles away. So. Again, you had to have a telescope to see the candle light. So again, the, uh, the light was good enough if you were sailing in trying, trying to avoid the, the reef to get into Plymouth. But again, it was a, a very difficult place to, uh, to work. The Couturon light in France, they used a, a, a polished metal cone that the light from a wood fire or a coal would reflect off of and go out into being in, that, in directions. And that was right on the top of a river that led down to Bordeaux, France, kind of along the lower French coast, a little bit south of the entrance to the English Channel. So a little bit of evolution. There was a, always a whale oil lamp that were used for centuries where a wick goes into a bucket of oil, a little can of oil, and it just burns and creates basically a candle power. The, uh, <clears throat> they used any, anything that would burn, whale oil, fish oil, uh, paraffin came in, didn't come in until the uh, advent of uh, oil. They had a pan light where you put a paraffin or oil in a series of lights, and they used those on the light ships. They would raise them up to the top of the light, and this whole series of little lights would be enough illumination so the ships coming in past where a reef was, or where they had a light ship, and they would uh, be able to see that. Then the bucket lights were, lamps were developed a few years after that, where these are receptacles that carry the, any drips of, off the wick that would come out of here, could carry it back to the reservoir, and then the cotton wicks would go down these tubes into the reservoir, and you hang it up, and that was your, your lighting supply. I saw one of those in an antique shop, and I'm still kicking myself for not buying it. It was only maybe $20, so it may have been a reproduction, probably a reproduction, but just to be able to hang on to it. But my wife said, what are you going to do with it? So, <laughs> yeah, those kind of comments. So going back to the single, single wick, you couldn't see very far, and the light went in all directions. There was no focus on those lights at all. 
So probably 5% of the light output from that light was available to the mariner who was looking to see where the heck he was. And put it in the top of castle as a primary lighting point or just a protected area near the point of, a, of land near the river that they're trying or the harbor. But 1782 was probably the major change. A Swissman by the name of Argon developed the uh, oil lamp that still bears his name. And the key to the whole thing was to making a hollow wick. He, he also made a, a uniquely shaped chimney that was required. So the air would come from the bottom through the wick the oil would be transported up to the wick by capillary action, and the air would be, rather coming from the outside, it would come up the middle and burn the oil more completely. So there were much less soot out of this particular kind of lamp than, uh, than the normal. And you can still find these things in uh, maybe on eBay or at some antique shops. Very elegant looking. Sometimes there's two light sources that are coming off the reservoir and they all work pretty much the same way. And they modified these for lighthouse use where they put in a bigger fuel reservoir, get better airflow, and you could get seven times the light out of this than you could off of a candle. So that was a very big improvement. Okay, a little bit more physics. It was easy to make a spherical reflector or a flat plane reflector. Just put something behind it and make all the light go that way. Worked pretty well. Spherical worked okay. It took most of the beams, but it didn't didn't focus the light. But if you made a parabolic reflector, which was a little bit more difficult to manufacture, <coughs> they, uh, they had a focal point, and if you put the light at the focal point of the parabolic reflector, all the light would come out in a straight line. So you had a beam basically the same size as a reflector. If you build a 24-inch reflector, you had a 24-inch beam. So you needed a fairly strong light in order to get that light all focused in the right direction. And that was really the direction everybody took, ultimately, to get away from the uh, spherical reflector. But they worked for a long time. So working with this Argan lamp and a single wick, they put them inside a reflector, put the oil reserve back here, and in the 1780s, put them together in a big rack like this in the early 1800s, had a clock motor here hooked to this, and it rotated. So you get a, a kind of a flash, and it was it was visible, in, uh, but it didn't go very, again very far because these were all seven times the candle power. But again, with the reflector, you get a little bit more light. But if you probably could get out ten miles, you were really doing very very well with it. There was some work done to uh, silver coat the the inside of the reflector, but then silver with heat and time tarnishes. So that, that was part of the keeper's job to clean those reflectors all the time and polish them with a silver coating. So that was sort of kind of self-defeating. Here's a picture of one of the catropic uh, approaches. And it, they, they worked quite well for a long, long time. And you can get about 40% of the useful light, again, primarily because of the reflector behind it. And they were used by everybody for uh, for instance, the first people to say, okay, we're going to go with the Fresnel lens. Because at the time, most of the, the mariners were world travelers. They would go to the U.S., they go to England, they go to France, they go to the Middle East, all over, and it was uh, down the Mediterranean. And they'd all have pretty much the same, and always complaining about not being able to see where they were going. <coughs> so, staying with the... the Argan lamp, they built these massive uh, parabolic silver reflectors, and again, they worked, but again, it was a major job to take care of it. Now, France had a very interesting educational system. Back probably in the mid 1700s, they started a, uh, an engineering school, School of Bridges and Roads, and they taught math and science. England at the same time had an a apprentice program where people learned their trade in an apprentice system. They didn't have that much education, so they learned how to do things 
just by lip working with other people. There was very little math involved in what they were doing while the French were moving along quite well with it. And Fresnel ended up going to the School of Bridges and Groves. Actually, it was designing canals when somebody learned that he had a great interest in, in light and lighting. So back in, in 1806, they formed the Lighthouse Commission, again, because of the, the mariners complaining about not being able to find entrances to the rivers and the harbors. So they put naval officers and scientists and governor inspectors in, into that operation so you could see who was going to work and what they, what they needed. And it, the lighthouses were based on good sound engineering principles, from the architecture of the building to the optics that were necessary to use. But again, they were still using these catropic apparatus of rotating uh, candles or, or, or lamp, oil lamps. So the cordon, cordon light in the uh, <clears throat> entrance to the Bordeaux is built in a 14th century, collapsed, rebuilt. Wikipedia had this little quote in it that uh, hazard to navigation threatened the wine trade. Well, you can't mess up with the wine trade, so they had to rebuild the lighthouse. The other thing, this lighthouse, the lower part of it, was built very much like a palace. It was designed so that the, uh, the royalty in France could go there and live in the same style they had if they stayed in Paris in their operations. So it's, it's been an operation since 1611 with upgrades to the lighthouse, but it still stands. And the Fresnel lens was installed in that in 1823, the first application of the Fresnel lens. So a little bit about Augustin Fresnel. He started in school, he started studying light. He introduced the wave theory of light. Up until that time, everybody thought light was particles. And when it hit your eye, it exploded and you could see it. But nobody understood it. It wasn't until he started fooling with lenses and found that the lens, a solid piece of glass, could bend light. And you knew it could not be a particle because it's part the glass would stop the particles. So he, he played with that for a while. There's a lot of uh, engineering work that you can find where he got into polarized light because when you shine light on a surface, part of it reflects back that, and the other part goes into that surface and becomes polarized. And depending on the material it's going through, changes the angle of polarization. We're not going to go into that. And, uh, and, uh, oh, there, there's some wonderful formulas if you want to get into it. Then in uh, 1819, he was appointed to the French Lighthouse Commission. He was just a young guy, right? not too much out of it. School. They pulled him off his canal development work or engineering work and said, we need you back here. He was a small guy, probably maybe 5'5", five, five, weighed 110, 115 pounds probably, and not very healthy. So getting to work back in, in an office building was uh, much to his favor. Probably prolonged his life for a long time. But in 1819, he proposed the Diopter Bullseye Lens, which I'll go into in a minute. And by putting them together, and it, this is pretty much the bullseye. Took that up in Corning the Museum. If you ever get to Corning, go spend, plan a day in that Corning Glass Museum. It's absolutely phenomenal. You learn about all about glass chemistry. They had just about every object ever made of glass from back in the very early days when it was found in the desert up to today's glass technology. It, it's really very, very well done. They, uh, they appointed him to the commission, so he developed this, proposed an eight bullseye lens. They haven't even built it yet, but he says, hey, we can put bullseyes in here and rotate this thing, and you'll have a really strong, bright flash every time it goes around. And then he also developed a multiple wick argon lamp, so they, uh, <clears throat> the air would come up through up as many as five uh, wicks later in time, but they maybe two or three were working when he did that, and in his design, he also came up with the order for the Fresnel lenses, the first order for the giant one down to the sixth order, which was about that big. So this is what he, out of one of his uh, drawing books, this is a, a normal convex, plano convex lens, and he said, why can't we take this and cut rings out of it? 
to the, each one of these sides has a different angle in relation to the back. So when light would go through it, it bends the light differently. So following this, it hits the, the glass, the speed of light going through the glass bends and it causes the light to go on a different angle. So he tried this and It, uh, I'll take a show it later. But it, uh, he, he built that out of uh, little pieces of glass they cut, polished, and glued together with the uh, high glue. So by 1919, they were, 1819, they were building a lens pretty much like this one that would uh, work. And by 1823, the first lens was put in the Cordon Lighthouse on the coast of France. And that light could be seen for 20 miles. It was that big of bright the light. The book I read talked about this, written by the Chance Brothers from England. So when he tested this, they put it on top of the Arc de Triomphe and lit up all of Paris as it rotated. So it, it had a lot of light capability. This is what I was looking for. The, uh, the lens was all made up of, of little pieces glued together because at the time, Casting curves in glass was very difficult. Remember that most of the glass that was done back in those days looked like the old green Coke bottles. It was not very clear. If you were going to make a piece of window glass, that stuff was fine. But when you're trying to shine light through it, it really was not really a practical glass. Clear glass, the, the only other one they had was a crystal that had a good quantity of lead in it, lead oxide. And that caused the weight of that glass to go up by about 20% over regular glass, plain glass. So that would make a very, very heavy lighthouse. So they tried to refine glass as best they could. I've not looked into the glass chemistry, how it evolved and make it pure, but they've done an awful lot of work. Today's glass fibers, you can run a beam of an LED down through 25, 30 miles and not lose anything. So you know the glass is pretty good. So this is basic theory of the Fresnel lens. Again, taking the uh, convex lens and just chopping it into sections and dropping them down and making it planar and shaping each curve of the glass so that when the light hit it, it would bend it and straighten it out. So going up to through the bullseye here, then the up uh, the other lens is a catatropic lens. They're taking advantage of light hitting the inside edge of a polished piece of glass, which acts as a mirror, goes up and, then, and makes it planar. So the Fresnel lens had the bullseye, is the optic part, and the catatropic part, catadioptric part, was in glass molded pieces that were curved and then set in brass pieces inside the, uh, inside the lens. They're, these things are really a work of art. Again, looking a little bit at the detail. But the, they're unique, the large ones especially, were unique to each lighthouse. They were built to uh, depend on how many flash panels they had, if you wanted it to rotate or not, all the rest of the, the problems. We'll get into some of the rotation issues in a little bit. But the main thing was the bullseye and the diaphragm part, and then the catadiaphragm were the reflective pieces. Now, this is a, a, the French design. These pieces, simply made, were all cut out of brass, and depending on the size of the lighthouse, or the light you were building, and the lighthouse that was needing it, they would be larger or smaller. This is probably a, uh, maybe a fourth order light, but the catadiaphric lens uh, would fit in here, the wedges, and then this was your bullseye section. The other thing that the French did that the English didn't know about at all, and these two folks didn't talk to each other. <laughs> they, uh, the heat from the lamp, from the burner here, kept the reservoir of fuel warm. So when the, it, it went down to the uh, wick, it didn't take much energy for it to vaporize. So they were able to get a much brighter, brighter beam out of the light here than they did where the English had the, the light source sitting outside their lens. Okay, these are pictures of just of the different orders and the different sizes of lenses that, that were made. These are, 
rather than talk about it all. Show you the side. And this is a drive mechanism. So very much have a clockwork mechanism that was made to drive clocks. All they did was put a gear on the top of this and the gear on the bottom of the light structure. This is over at the uh, Whaling Museum in Nantucket. <coughs> Again, a great place if you ever get out there. Spend a half a day there at, at least. <laughs> so they uh, managed to make all these. By 1830, the French had the half, half of the coast, the critical locations with Fresnel lenses in them. And they dropped the average number of shipwrecks down by about 60, 55 anyhow, since it was introduction. So it was it was a very good thing to do. The uh, shipwrecks were constant problems, and there were small ships, didn't know where you were going, you only had sails, so it, it took a, a good guy a, as a mariner captain to find, a, to get a ship someplace, and, and to find crew would even go on it because you'd lose a lot of them. It, that was part of the uh, lighthouse keeper's job, was to also to uh, rescue. But they continued to populate the coast, <coughs> And I remember all this thing was happening during the French Revolution when, when all this work was being done. So it was, even though the, the people of France were having a problem with the government, the, uh, the work was going down to get it uh, put together. Now, England first had a, a guild that handled the lighthouses. And it was primarily a, uh, a union of lighthouse workers. England loved their union to support the seafarers, and every ship that passed a lighthouse, a point where a lighthouse was and they had the catastrophic lights, they uh, had to pay a, a fee when they came into port. So you pass 10 lighthouses, you pay 10 times those fees to the, to the Trinity Guild. And that provided money, and then they owned and operated all the lighthouses. Again, they didn't have a lot of technology, didn't advance the technology, and all they really tried to do is polish the lens better or the uh, reflectors better and make better lighting. So they really didn't uh, work on bringing in the, uh, the Fresnel lens. Well, they really didn't want to do anything. But in 1851, there were enough sea captains that came from up the French coast and over to England and said, you guys have to see what that light is in France and go over and get some of these. So there was some effort going back and forth between the uh, Trinity House Lighthouse beef engineers in France to uh, make it work. So they modernized the Eddystone light. This is a 1905 postcard that I found that has the Fresnel lens in it. So it was up in there before 1905. Now the other problem with these lenses, they're heavy. They weigh a couple of tons. And they made, made them in the factory, put them together, took them apart, put them in wooden crates, and then shipped them off to where they were going, had to rebuild them in the uh, location. So the U.S. was even worse than England. They uh, had the fifth auditor of the treasury, was a guy by the name of Pleasanton. He was an accountant, and his job was to keep track of lighthouse expenses. And he didn't know, when he started off, what a catatropic light was. He didn't know about the uh, reflector lights or anything. So this guy, Winslow Lewis from Maine, had a design, better, he called it a better design than what the English were using and that had been used in, in the U.S. of the reflectors approach. And he said to uh, Pleasanton, I'll make a deal with you. You put in my, my lights and I'll give you half of what we save on oil. And being a bookkeeper, he said, that's a great thing to do. I'll, I'll do that. So he really didn't care about anything about technology at all. He just wanted to worry about keeping the bottom line as low as he could. But it wasn't until 1830, he knew of the Fresnel lens, had never seen one, but some of the sea captains that were coming back into the States were saying, hey, the French has a great light, we should get it. And, and he said, no, never work, never work. We can't, we can't afford them. So they basically, the Mariners went to Congress and said, you guys have to get rid of this guy. <laughs> so uh, they actually uh, had Mr. Pleasanton retire, and Congress went, went into, over to France 
and bought two first and second order lights and installed them in the highlands. And you come across the ocean, go across Long Island, first thing you're going to see are the highlands, and New York Harbor is off to the right. So they installed them up there. The first, I'm not sure which is the first and which is the second order of light. And one of them rotated. And they, the reason they put the two lights together so people would know where they were. They, the Mariners all called them the twin lights. So you, whenever you saw the twin lights, you knew you were approaching New York City Harbor. And that was the opening of the Erie Canal at the time. So there was a tremendous amount of trade going on back and forth in Manhattan Island. So they, uh, they put those in. And then by 1852, the US established the Lighthouse Board, again, modeled after what France was doing with Navy people with uh, engineers and uh, some science people involved. And uh, by 1860, all the U.S. lighthouses were uh, Fresnel optics. When did the Civil War start? Anybody remember? 1861. It didn't take much longer. That one of the books that I read, called A Short Bright Flash, written by a historian from some college somewhere. Great, excuse me, great book, but it uh, talks about what happens when the Civil War started and the North blockaded all the southern harbors. The southerners went up and beat up all the Fresnel lenses that were installed in all the light, in most of the lighthouses. Many Fresnel lenses were taken apart, but most of them were damaged and destroyed. They pushed them over the top or whatever, just so the, uh, the North would not see where the harbors were with the lighthouses. So, uh, Today, the Coast Guard manages some of them as aids of navigation, but they're more getting out of that. I think the Coast Guard has pretty much abandoned any lighthouses now, and they're all being turned over to historical operations, that sort of thing. So this is a little bit hard to read, but it gives you a little bit of information on the height. A first order light is primarily for seacoast. Overall height is almost eight feet. Inside diameter is six feet. Now that's a pretty good piece of optics. And the light sits in the middle, so you need a pretty good burner, high power light inside that to be an effective beam for that. And as you go along, the, uh, the light gets smaller, where the six order is about 18 inches tall and just a small little light. But again, it does exactly what you want it to do. It sends out a bright beam of light and it's good for five miles. It's, again, shows you a cross-section of the pieces. And like I mentioned earlier, all these pieces are, are the same. If you want it up here, they're just made a little bit smaller to fit in here. The brass pieces are all the same, so it just depends on how many bullseyes you want in your light flash panels and how, you, how it gets assembled as to what you're going to need. And that's entirely up to the lighthouse engineer. Now the other thing is the lantern, the box around the lighthouse, the building around it. This railing was not made to go out for the keeper to go out and stand and see what the ships are going by. That's so he can keep the panes of glass clean, both inside and out. There's, if you get out to the round out light, there's these little ventilator openings at the bottom, and there's a ventilator wall at the top. When you have a lamp burning in there, you need to have light. And when the wind is blowing, you have to be able to close these off in various places so that you're not getting too much air and causing the light to burn too fast. So all, all this would have to be done in order to make sure the light was burning well and then the warm air would escape out the ventilator wall. This is one of the largest light uh, lights that's ever been built. It's, this is something like 12 feet tall and it was installed in 18, uh, 1909 and it uses a five or did use a five way oil lamp. This lens does not rotate, it just fixed. It's sitting on the southeast corner of Oahu, so the first thing that the mariners see when they're coming from the States over the Hawaiian Islands would be this light. And it projects a beam out about thirty miles. Yeah. And the historic lighthouse preservation manual shows these different standard first order, second order, third order, and smaller light lantern rooms that go on the top of the lighthouses. I've often wondered when you, we go around and look at lighthouses, my wife and I have joined the Lighthouse Society a number of years ago and gone on a number of their tours. And you get looking at some of the older lighthouses, 
all the lanterns look alike. And I didn't, I didn't know why. It was until they had this manual that says this is what it's going to look like. So some standardization thinking. So this is what the keeper had to do. The, the guy didn't have much to do all day long, so he had the least to do. Light the lamps at night, get them off in the morning, trim the, the wick square for every four hours. So you had at least two lamps, three lamps in the ready room, which is, if you go out and around the light, it's the room underneath where the lighthouse, is, the light is. And you had a table there, so you had your extra oil, you had your lamps, you came, keep those ready to go. So when the light went down, you'd go up and put another one in, go back to sleep for another couple hours, and so didn't get a good night's sleep for a long time. Had to keep the oil supply, keep them safe, and then, by the way, fill in your logbook. Now, these are a couple of lights that are in museums. They're far, worth far, far more than uh, what you can imagine anymore. Finding pieces of them is almost impossible. This is in uh, Sand Island, Alabama light, and this is the light in uh, from the Centennial Head out of Nantucket in the Whaling Museum. This is the light. There's a light inside the, the lighthouse and the lens. This rotates. Here's a bullseye. And it rotates around the room and they project the light on, on the inside wall as it's rotated. It's really neat. These are two hyperregular lenses. The 1893 World's Fair in Chicago had the, one, the light that's installed in Makapuru Point in Oahu, 12 foot high, 1,000 prisms, that was made in France. And then the Chance Brothers of England built this one to go in uh, Karachi, Pakistan. 20 tons, 1.1 million candelabra, and it, it's bright. It, again, I, don't, I didn't look at about where it was on the map to uh, see that. Now, lamp development went a long way from single wick to a five wick burner, which you needed when you had a uh, first order lens. And then, like I mentioned, there were the uh, Scandinavian folks played a lot with it, acetylene and uh, vaporized gases in order to uh, fire their lights. It worked out pretty well. Then there was a group got together and said, okay, let's try and find out what lighthouse had what kind of a burner in it. So they cataloged all those and went down through who made the lamp and uh, all this information, lots of digging, in. but the American Lighthouse Council put this list together. Now there's some unique inventions. This is probably the smartest, simplest thing I, I've ever seen. Patented in Sweden, the gas goes on at dusk and off at dawn. The bars on the outside are gold plated. The inside bar is black iron. Sunlight hits the black bar. It expands, goes down and shuts up off the gas valve. Have a little pilot light in there. When the sun goes down, cools the bar, the gas valve opens up, and the light comes on again. The best idea I've seen here for a long time. We all could think about that today. But 18, in 1912, or 1907, when the guy patented it, and ended up getting a Nobel Prize for it, it was really a great thing, because otherwise they were burning gas all day long. So now they almost cut all their gas usage in half. And then Corning took the smaller Fresnel lenses and basically turned it inside out rather than having the, uh, the points of glass to make the uh, reflective part of the lens on the outside. They put them on the inside. And you find these all over the place today. All your, and they also developed the uh, red light, the red color in the glass which is standard railroad red. You'll find that everywhere in all the old railroad lanterns, all work with exactly the same kind of lens. Now, rotation. You have this great big thing that weighs three ton, uh, four or five tons. How do you turn that? In the, in the smaller ones, you can turn the base, but the bigger ones, you wanted to just rotate the glass. So they built, and the, and the mechanism, even on the base, required whoop, required uh, little wheels to support the mechanism and they all had to be the same diameter and turn freely otherwise the entire mechanism would hang up 
So that worked for a while. Ball bearings didn't, couldn't take the load. So Fresnel, back in the early days of, of lighthouses, he said, why don't we float the, the thing in mercury? Which they did for the, the larger, the uh, first and second order lenses. And it worked very, very well. Well, everybody knows, in fact, my wife was reading a novel about a lighthouse keepers somewhere. And they mentioned that the majority of lighthouse keepers, when they found out what the cause of death is primarily mercury poison in the bigger lighthouse, because they, uh, they were working around this mercury, exposed, and the room would be warm, and they breathed in a lot of mercury vapor. And by, uh, I think, 19, no, by year 2000, there's no mercury in any lighthouse anywhere. So it, it really worked very, very well for these big lights. But the large lenses had to rotate once in eight to 10 minutes. Some had as many as 24 or five panels, which was great. The more panels, the heavier the lens, the slower rotation. And just a big wear problem making, making these things work. And we're now proposing it in 1825 using mercury. And the French developed the lightning flash. You can almost take your finger and spin that great big first order lens. And the, the stripping industry said, no, no, that's way too fast. We, we don't even see that. So you're better off having something uh, maybe a fifth of a second go, as, as it passes you. That's really good. And ball bearings didn't work. The friction was too high. So no, the mercury really solved the problem for the, for the time that they had it. And the first mercury bath light end up going down on the southeast corner, excuse me, southwest corner of Australia. This was made in England, trucked it all the way halfway around the world to put in the lighthouse on it in Cape Louis. And the, each half was 114 inches across, 6,000 pounds, and they had 500 pounds of mercury in the trough that supported the, uh, the light. And it rotated once every 10 seconds. Now this, I don't know if you can read that in the back, the, uh, one of the masters of one of the, of the steamships went by there he says, it is without exception the finest oil light I've seen. The quick flash is grand, compels attention, and once seen, leaves no uncertainty where is the cape. Well, in the background, I put a map of Australia. This is the western side of Australia, Northwest Territory, right down here in the corner. If you miss that, guys, you're south pole. So it was very important that they knew where that, that, that light was. So the factories were in France and in, and in uh, England. They had big, massive factories because back then they, they didn't really have a lot, lot of uh, uh, ways to do things other than by hand. These lathes, which were grinding wheels primarily, they were turned by horses on treadmills. They hadn't really commercialized the steam engine yet. And here's a, in the background of this litho is a light being assembled. And now different, one of the uh, French factories, but again, similar in size and structure. Chance Brothers in England, they are still in business. Now if you're travelers, make some of these places on your list to uh, go out and visit. They, uh, they're all first order lights and they're really an impressive thing to get up and see. St. Augustine, Florida is right in town. They just were awarded the, some national museum foundation, awarded them the best lighthouse museum in the country. It's a magnificent place, so next time you're getting to Florida, go to St. Augustine and go to that lighthouse. Climb up halfway, there's a landing. They have a bucket with bricks in it. it simulates a weight of five gallons of oil. And your job is to carry it up to the up to the main landing for the work areas, so you get a feel for what the lighthouse keepers had to do. But that was you're only carrying it halfway; they had to carry it all the way. This is Makapuku Point. We were out there a number of years ago, 2011, and this is the picture I had before. That's my picture. I didn't know what it was at the time I took that picture, but it's a, it's a grand light. It doesn't rotate, but now this is inside the first order lake down in St. Augustine. We were down there a couple of years ago, <coughs> the lower one, and Sacred Island in Maine. Haven't been to that one. That takes a boat to get out to. But 
here. Here you can see the, uh, the flash panels here. And this one doesn't have any flash panels on this, on this side. And then the Boston light, that's the oldest operating lighthouse in the United States. That's a wonderful light. There's a, a keeper who is hired by the Coast Guard Auxiliary who dresses in costume, and she does a, a wonderful job of interpreting the light. And you can get a, light, a boat out there from Hull or from Boston and visit the lighthouse. This is the Boston light. That flashes every 12 seconds. It's a second order light. And you can see the flash panels in this. There are there's 12 flash panels. So that every time that rotates, it'll basically give you a light like this, where you're getting that, that rotating flash coming around all the time. I've not seen that at night. Mm -hmm. Now, something to think about. See this guy working? He has a little shade here. A lot of times they have shades over all these. Remember you put a great big bright light here and it shines through these glasses and shines a great big light out this way. Well, when the sun shines back in here, these lenses focus you down to the point right here, where many lighthouse keepers have been burned without even thinking about it. So you put shades up here to keep the sun from shining in and creating a, <coughs> creating a, a working area where you could, you could melt steel. In fact, there was a Scotsman who invented a Fresnel lens, unbeknownst to the French, and he called it a burning lens. And he used it to melt metal and, and, take, and extract metal out of rock by shining that light on the stones and extracting the ore. But uh, he had no idea about putting light on the inside of it and shining out. This is what it's like to change the light inside a second order light. The bullseyes are, are large, as you get up. This was out of a magazine. The quote is out of a, uh, a manual. When the light is extinguished at the morning, the keeper must hang the lantern curtains and immediately begin putting the apparatus in order for relighting. While doing this, the linen aprons provided for the keepers must be worn. The lens must not suffer contact with his wearing apparel. The illuminating apparatus, the light anchor in the center of the Fresnel lens from the editor, must be carefully covered before cleaning is begun. The lens and glass lanter must be cleaned daily and always kept in the best possible condition. Before beginning to clean the lens, it must be brushed with a feather brush to remove all the dust. Then wiped with a soft linen cloth and finally polished with a buff skin. That was every day, every morning's activity after you shut the light down, probably before breakfast. And they also had to mix all their chemicals, all their, all their polishing materials. The brass had to be kept clean and uh, out of an interesting article in Lighthouse Society. This is the inside of a Fresnel lens, maybe the Boston light, I have no idea, with all the flash panels, but a burner going in, in the middle and the exhaust gases brought up to the top. The uh, airport beacon lights, where they were taking a Lighthouse, the Fresnel lenses out, couldn't find spare parts for it, and many pieces were broken over time. So this is inside the Chatham light, where they have two uh, Air Force beacon lights that rotate constantly to uh, provide the light at that Chatham point, Chatham bar. This is the Hudson Athens light. If you get up in that someday, they run a ferry from Athens, stops at the lighthouse, over to Hudson, and back the other way. So. Anytime you get up that way, you can, in the summertime, you grab the ferry, go out to the lighthouse, tour the lighthouse. And then this is the Osopus Meadows light. That's hard to get to anymore. They used to have a boat. They do not have that anymore. And the, uh, the lantern room is just about big enough for one person to lay sideways in it. It's a, just a tiny little lantern room. But at least the light is back. It used to be on a pole outside the lighthouse. So the light is back inside. It is an aided navigation and they're very proud of having it in there. And these are both reverse design Fresnel lenses where the light is on the inside and the focusing is from that point. But all the, all the dusty parts are, are buried within the plastic box. This is the original light from, uh, from Saugerties, a uh, uh, 
sixth order, excuse me, fifth order, and they did an awful lot of looking and found that light in some retired admiral's home in, I think, Illinois or Michigan, I don't remember where. They have an interesting story about that on their website. And that uh, today's light is this little plastic one with a four second flash. And if you look at the nav charts, it describes where the light is and its uh, flash and whereabouts. Don't need all of that today. GPS handles it. So what do we do today? Have these big LED things that will shoot a uh, 360 degree beam, high intensity flat, exceeding 10 nautical miles. And then we were out in uh, Cape Cod last fall, and the Highland Light, which is just before you get into Provincetown on the right hand side, is a stack of marine beacons. These, depending on what you want to build and how big a light you want to handle, just stack up as you need more and more of the, uh, the LEDs. And they, they're designed with the uh, vertical <coughs> lens so that while the light is on each of these shining out, this one's, you're not seeing the light because it's going straight out. It, it's not wa being wasted going down. And there's a preservation manual if you want to get involved. It's on the National Park Service website, so it tells you all about what is necessary to uh, restore a lighthouse. And the U.S. Lighthouse Society has a National Lighthouse Museum just off from the uh, Staten Island Ferry on Staten Island. It was the old General Lighthouse Depot that was used to supply all the, they, they bring in the pieces for the Fresnel lenses, assemble them, get them into shape, shape to ship to the various lighthouses, and make sure everything was right before they went out. That was back in the 1800s, so it's, it's great that they were able, the Lighthouse Society were able to get access to that building and use it now for lighthouse. These are a couple of things that I, I've dug through. I didn't get the, uh, the, flash, the uh, short bright flash that's on, that I mentioned earlier on the resource list, but it's, it's a good thing to do and take a look at. So, go visit the lighthouse. They're, they're, they're fun. Good exercise. God, you'd love them. You can run up the steps.